Yes, hello, and welcome to Release the Creative, your favorite show about creativity, cognition, and this week, Gleaming the Cube. Gleaming? Gleaming, with an M. Gleaming the Cube. Gleaning is also a word, right? Yes, gleaming and gleaning, both words. Okay, so I don't know gleaming. What does gleaming mean? Um... You know what? Just for the purposes of this, I'm actually going to give you the dictionary definition. Yeah, no, this it, is this is definitely a time for dictionary.com. Adjective of a smooth surface, reflecting light, typically because very clean or polished. Like okay, shiny. It was gleaming. Yes. Okay. No, I think I, I, th- I, I was pretty sure that was it, but I didn't want to be wrong. No, that, yeah. that that does sound right to me. Now it's just not a word that comes up a lot. So tell me again, gleaming cube. Cl- gleaming the cube. Oh, the cube. Okay, that's what threw me off. I've heard of gleaming as like a thing is gleaming. I don't know of it in the, as a verb. As a verb, I've never yeah. verbed gleaming. I assume <laughs> it means to polish. No, 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 it doesn't. Actually, gleaming the cube is a more or less gibberish statement from a 1989 movie of the same name, Gleaming the Cube, where a guy refers to it and contextually it can only be re- like in the con he's he's a skateboarder and he was being interviewed in thrasher magazine and he talks about gleaming the cube being like that like that moment where you're like totally in touch with it man so is gleaming the cube an actual skateboarding phrase that made its way into a movie or is this uh how hollywood like hacks the server and <laughs> that is how hollywood sat hacks the server but what's funny about the unintended consequences of this is gleaming the movie gleaming the cube christian slater 1989 okay. one of my favorites of course is terrible <laughs> I love it so much. There's a reason I haven't heard of it. It's so bad. So it's skateboarding. It's a skateboarding. It's a it's a murder mystery film noir starring Christian Slater, who is a skateboarding. So this is dude. just skateboarding. What Fast and the Furious is to cars. Yes. Sort of. But Fast and the Furious, he's a cop. So it it's uh, the um, Christian Slater is a is a skateboarding burnout. And his adopted Vietnamese brother is murdered uh, for falling into kind of some some bad areas by the by the the Asian mafia, and so uh, Christian Slater and his ragtag bunch of skateboarders uh, solve the crime. Solve the crime. Okay, so actually, it's more like Scooby Doo. <laughs> yes, that's a terribly yes. It is a 1989 Scooby Doo starring Christian Slater as a skateboarder. Right. Okay. Now the reason I bring all of this up is that the term "gleaming the cube," according to Urban Dictionary. Because of the movie, not because of what they, not because of how they use it in the movie, but because of the movie itself, um, gleaming the cube uh, to fail so badly that there is brilliance in the failure, a phrase (laughs) coined by cinema arbiter bloggers in reference to the 1989 movie starring Christian Slater. Okay, so it's it's so bad it's good kind of way. So 1980, it's Grease 2 is a gleaming the cube movie. I love. Okay. Okay. I, I, I'm surprised I've never heard this. Now. So gleaming the cube means to fail so awful that like it's actually you've gone full circle and you're good again. What's the phrase? If it's stupid and it works, it wasn't stupid. It wasn't stupid. Right. So I've been thinking a lot about gleaming the cube over the last few days because at 38 years old, and I mean, you, I, I know you know this, but at 38 years old, uh, I bought a skateboard. My first ever. It's not like, yeah, I'm going to pick that back up. I haven't skated since high school or middle school or element. No, no. Brand new. I was given a skateboard, I think, for my eighth Christmas. It had neon green grip tape and a Batman logo on it. Um, (laughs) Did not get a lot of use. It was one of those old 80s ones that looked like a fish. Mm -hmm. Like now they look like a popsicle stick. Yeah. But I, uh, I, I, you know, I put on my helmet, my elbow pads and my knee pads and my wrist guards. And I went out in my cul-de-sac and went around a few times and. I no idea what happened to that skateboard. It was never a thing. I was eight. Since then, at 38, 30 years later, uh, I bought my my first real skateboard and I went to a skate park this weekend just to find out what a midlife crisis really feels like. How'd that go? Feels like really bruised hips. <laughs> like, I mean, the, the audio podcast couldn't see and I'm not going to torture the video podcast with it, but... Like, there is a dinner plate sized black and blue sphere, uh, uh, all, uh, oval on my left hip and shoulder uh, that's impressively painful. You actually. sure gleamed that cube. I sure gleamed that cube. I did. It When actually it happened, uh, to actually to go more linearly, like, so I showed up at 9 a.m. and there was this one kid there, like 13, 14 years old, and his dad was there, and I was I was trying to do a couple things, and I kept, like, running off the board and, and doing really, really, really bad. Uh, and finally, I, I noticed this kid just kind of watching me, and I'm, I'm trying not to feel too self-conscious, and he comes over and goes... 
can I give you a tip? I'm like, oh, dear God. <laughs> yes. Yes, you may. I don't know, 13-year-old boy. This is like set up for a classic burn. <laughs> oh, and for the record, I would have been fine with that, too. This is either going to be really helpful advice or I'm going to respect the crap out of this kid. Like, one of the two. Uh, no, and he's like, don't push off like that. Your feet are wrong. You're this. Your board's too small. Like, And he, like, was very informative and very helpful. And so his dad gave me a few tips as well. Uh, and so I immediately went to a skate shop. I bought that board for $30 on Amazon and, uh, I went to a skate shop and spent too much money, more than $30, more than $30 on a real deck on a, mm. and, and they, like they built it for me and everything. And I headed to a different skate shop. I, a skate park. I wanted to do this. I wanted to gleam the cube, Jeff, <laughs> like they used it in the movie, not like is used of the movie. Okay. Like I wanted We've done I, it the one way. Now we're going to try the other. I wanted to feel like that, that, uh, that perfect cement wave, you know, uh, and I get there and the first the first skate park was more like a tennis court with some ramps on it. Mm -hmm. The second skate park was more like manufactured cement. Uh, like there was a pool there, like a big empty pool and big cement like nice. Uh, it's really it's a very nice park. Actually, it's actually near here, which I didn't know. It's pretty awesome. First park, one person. Second park, 18, 20 people. It was it was a it was it was a crowded ish day. Mm -hmm. And I went and I'm like, I'm not going to. I think the oldest person there was probably 18. The average was probably 13 to 16 ish. And I'm like, I'm not going to be afraid of this. I'm not going to pansy. I'm not going to run away. I'm, I'm going to do this. And I went and I, I went in and I, I started hitting things and I kept, uh, at one time I kind of shot off the board and the board like went at, went at this other guy and I went to get the board and I'm feeling kind of embarrassed. He's like, he's, and he said, man, you're getting it. Like with no irony. I was like, he's like, you are getting it. I'm like, I was like, I was like, it's my first day, man. Like, he's like, no, seriously, man, you're learning, but you're doing really well. You're like, you're, you're obviously new. <laughs> and, he, uh, and I was like, yeah, this is my first, uh, this is my first skateboard, uh, you know, in, in, in 30 years. And he's he's like, wow, I'm 16. <laughs> like, and, and this kid ended up like giving me a couple of tips. Uh, a few minutes later, as I was riding, one of his friends came over and said, can I see your board please? And adjusted my trucks. He's like, I think I'm going to help a little bit. And that everyone was crazy encouraging, uh, to the point of when I fell the big bad fall, I fell a lot, but like the big bad one, the entire skate park just froze and was like, dude, are you okay? <laughs> and I bounced up. I'm like, yeah, I got this. And I stayed for another hour after that. And the bruise on my hip is, is, is a thing of beauty. You don't feel it at first. I know. I feel it today though. It's two days later. And I use gleaming the cube here because it's just a, it's apropos to skating, but B like I failed so tragically on Saturday. It was, but three things stood out. One, I was the most fun I'd had in months. Like I was like, I had, I was out, I was breathing fresh air. I was doing something that was so far out of my comfort zone. I was not doing anything that I've have any muscle memory for. Yeah. I mean, I ride a motorcycle. There's some balance in that. And I'm so, but like, no, this is completely outside of anything that I'd been familiar with. And it was awesome. I failed over and over again. And the amount of support that I got through my failure and the failure itself was probably the most fun I had. Like it was just, it was so cool to watch other people do things and, and let them kind of give me tips and encouragement around my utter failures. And, mm -hmm. and so I, I got back and I was like, I started Googling gleaming the cube because I hadn't seen it since like 92, 93. And I loved that movie growing up. And I found out that it actually has come to mean in certain circles to fail beautifully. And I'm like, it's like the perfect allegory here. That's what you did. I did. I failed beautifully and I'm going to keep going and failing beautifully till I stop failing at it. But that's another story. I thought you were going to say you looked it up and it turns out it was all a fever dream and the movie never existed. <laughs> You know, that would be one Mandela effect that I would mourn. <laughs> like, you know, the movie Kazam or Shazam or not existing, whatever. The Berenstain Bears, I can get over. To find out that I imagined gleaming the cube <laughs> would be, mer I would feel the weight of that loss. That, that would be pretty tragic. That would be tragic. You should watch it. It's terrible. Is it available anywhere? <laughs> Good question. I remember... Uh, a movie from my childhood that was surprisingly difficult to find was the uh, Dave Thomas Boris and Natasha movie based on Rocky and Bullwinkle. So that one's hard to come by. It is not available on Amazon. Like it's listed here, but it is you can't buy it. Uh, Justwatch.com. This is going to involve a uh, VHS tape 
sent from Europe. Uh, I didn't know that I needed this to happen, but now that I have found <laughs> out, it's not just like click here. Oh no, this is going to happen now simply because I'm on my fourth website now and it's not available anywhere. And I am not going to let that injustice stand. It, so Tony's Tony Hawk plays a role in this movie. Once you get this, it's going to have to go on your Tuesday night podcast. Yes. Right? My Tuesday, if you guys are unaware of my Tuesday night podcast, uh, 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 reels in the round with Ronan and Kirk. We do a movie podcast every Tuesday night. Um, no, I am. I am. I am, I'm not okay with this. <laughs> yeah, there's some. There's some weird black holes out there. I found movies that like you can only get from like the 1992 DVD if someone still happens to be selling it on eBay. And other than that, I can buy nowhere. it from. I can buy it from Walmart. That seems suspicious. It says that it's on Walmart.com DVD only. Nowhere is streaming it. I can buy. I wonder if they make it. Check this out. I can buy a used copy off Amazon for $50. That's a collector's item. <laughs> this might be happening. I'm embarrassed to say that I might spend $50 on a 19, a, a DVD of a 1989 Christian Slater film. We'll keep uh, digging. What you need to look for is there some sort of like Christian Slater box set because maybe Ooh. you can get every Christian Slater movie for not much more than $50. For the record, like two movies later was his movie Cuffs, which is probably one of my favorite movies of all times, but that's a different story. Um, no, and so I bring up this not just to say that I, I have a bruise the size of a dinner plate on my hip, but to say that it made me think of the story that everyone, every Steve Jobs fan tells too much of of the calligraphy, of how he dropped out of Davidson College and are, are unenrolled. He, you know, he didn't drop out officially. And so he dropped in on a calligraphy class. Uh, he was feeling just uh, kind of lost and bored and he didn't know kind of what was going on. So he went and he took calligraphy cla uh, calligraphy from a uh, from a a monk. Mm -hmm. And a decade later. A decade later, when he was at Apple and they were creating the first graphical user interface and they were creating the the he remembered how much he'd loved serif fonts and sans serif fonts and letting and kerning and stuff. And so instead of just creating I mean, word processors had existed for over a decade at that point, but they were all just typewriter or very simple dot matrixy font. He wanted to do fonts. And so he put in a couple of dozen fonts and. That blew up and then uh, Microsoft came and copied everything. And so now thousands of fonts is a thing and it might sound overly simplified. We might have gotten there anyway. But the reason what started that ball rolling is that Steve Jobs took a calligraphy class. The man was in computer development. There is no logical reason to take a calligraphy class. There's no there's no reason. There's no good use of time. Yeah, this is like in your uh, book, you have the chapter about the guy who told you not to go to film school. Yeah. Uh, but then you went to film school. Right. But ignoring that little issue, the advice. And for was, the record, I shouldn't have. I should have listened to him. The advice was to uh, learn things outside of your sphere because yeah, right. you don't know how they're going to interact. Well, and you don't know how they're going to act, but even even more so, there's this big push right now. And I almost want this to turn into a flame war in the comments. So please, I kid you not, come at me. Um there's this big push right now of like, don't go to college. That's stupid. Like, and again, the debt of college, I'm not arguing. This is not a financial yeah. conversation, but you're like, you know, like, don't go to college. Just go do learn by doing, go out and, you know, chase your dreams by doing them. And Gary V, I love you. That's great advice, except that it's stupid. Um, now going into horrific debt over it, different thing. Right. But I also talk about in the book, the, the, the concept of the liberal arts education is a lost art. Right now, it just means waste of time, but it shouldn't like taking a humanities class to understand how people think and live and interact. That's only a waste of time if you really don't care about the information. Yeah. But understand there is no purpose in life. There's no CEO down to stock boy, stock girl, stock person that could not benefit from taking a humanities class to understand, you know, humanity. Same thing with a, a, an economy, an economics class. I've never taken economics class because my college didn't require it. I don't work with money. I don't. Work, but I would be well served by having some better understanding of, of economics. Yeah. College, I think, is really misunderstood in general. And this isn't what today's thing is about. But it's about we should always be collecting diverse and crazy, you know, and crazy experiences to add. I understand that I just followed up. Steve Jobs dropped out of college 
to take a calligraphy class. Everyone should go to college. I, I understand that there's a well, the, the, the story is he dropped out of college and then went to a class. Yeah, <laughs> so like, like that's still a essential part of the story there. Yes, I did the exact opposite. I went to a school that was I got a bachelor's degree in under two years, hyper focused, mm-hmm. no fluff, long days, no breaks, no summer, one week for Christmas, one spring break. Like it was a it was a. A march. It was a march. I got a bachelor's degree in less than two years. No fluff. Just go. And at the time, that sounded brilliant. And I was like, yeah, let's not waste any time. I know what I'm doing. And I got out and I was like, I knew how to take apart a camera blindfolded. And that is not a you. I really could take apart and reassemble a 35 millimeter film camera blindfolded. Mm -hmm. Less than five years later, we would not be using uh, film cameras in film production anymore. Yeah. I could. I went into a dark room and I could do an entire photo series in a dark room in the pitch black blindfolded. That went away almost immediately. By the time I finished film school, that class was no longer offered. offered. Yep, yep. Yeah. But humanities or or other things that would have film theory. I didn't take a single. I went to film school. I didn't take a single film theory class. They're like, you'll figure it out. I, everything was technical. Everything was was pointed. And so I got out and had nothing to say. But you find out, you know, as we start to. Uh, you find out that creativity, the definition of creativity is misaligning memories, is taking things that shouldn't work together and putting them together and and trying new things and trying new combinations. You know, strawberries and bananas aren't from the same area, but strawberry banana is a flavor that's, you know, awesome. They work together. Someone thought of that one day. It's now ubiquitous, but it, the first time it wasn't. Yeah. Uh, so gleaming the cube has become my new favorite phrase, not just because I'm learning to skateboard and it hurts, Jeff, <laughs> moving hurts, but because the movie failed, but it's so good. And I failed, but it was so much fun and we shouldn't be afraid of trying crazy things. And I understand that that's misusing the, that's like not quite what gleaming the cube means in the context of bad movies, but it's. We should always be enduring to try new, bigger, better, crazier, harder things and things that people are like, dude, that's a terrible idea. I know. Right. But what if it worked? Uh, my last little movie anecdote to this point of uh, there's a movie. I want to say, you know, it's 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 The Rock and Kevin Hart, but that doesn't actually narrow it down these days. It's happened more than once, hasn't it? It's the it's the CIA movie. I don't know the name, but I know which one you mean. Yes. Anyway, he's uh, he's like, he's like, okay, I got a. He's like, I got a great idea. Probably not gonna work. Probably gonna kill us both. But if it, hey, but but if it works, it's gonna be a dope op uh, story. You win. No. Okay. And they go for it. He's like, I said no. I said no. And it of course works. But whereas it's meant to be funny in the movie, I think we need to all in a very very real way. Hey, let's try this. It's probably not gonna work. It's gonna fail miserably. But if it works, it's gonna be a dope story. Yeah. That was uh when I was a kid and it was like, you had to like jump off the high dive board or, you know, something that was a little scary, but like you'd climbed up there, you knew you had to do it. The, uh, the little mental thing that I would (laughs) do, I'd get to the edge of the diving board and I'd be like, should I do this? Should I not do it? And I would jump and say, well, too late to decide. (laughs) And like, that was like a a thing I did as a kid with things that would like make me a little uncomfortable or scared or, you know, Yeah, you really jumping off any height. It only, you only have to make one very, very, very small decision. The rest is just made for you. But it was, it was difficult to decide to do it. So like I skipped it. Like that's a weird thing to say, but like I made myself jump without deciding. I made myself jump while I was still considering it. (laughs) I like that. Uh, Like I was like, that's an interesting mental. I'm going to jump. Then I'll think about it. And then I was like, well, now I don't have to think about it anymore. Problem solved itself. <laughs> that it, it's. Um, oh, hold on. Amazon five film collection. <sighs> Liars. <laughs> it's not in there. We'll keep looking. We're going to keep looking for gleaming the cube. But we're uh, also going to take a quick break and we are going to be if I can push my buttons right. We'll be back in just a second. All right, and we're back, and uh, we're talking about being inspired to be creative, because creativity is not a magic wand. And it's not. It's not uh, 
magic fairy dust. It's just uh, it's taking old memories and combining them in weird ways. It's it's strange. Like I saw, you know, Huffington Post and, and such a, a while back. They were like, you know, how to exercise your creativity. And I in no way intend to, you know, I'm not calling anyone in particular out. I read a bunch of articles and they all said basically the same thing. They're like, to be more creative, practice being creative. <laughs> It's just like uh, any other skill. yeah. <laughs> right. But the problem is if you, to be better pl- at playing hockey, go play hockey. There's ways to look up hockey. There's ways like, oh, you want to learn how to juggle. You want to get better at juggling, juggle more. There's ways to look up ju- what none of these things did. They're like, yeah, practice creative ideas. You can't <clears throat> use the word in defining the way. And it was, it was so fascinating to me. I read so many articles at many different blogs and things and a couple of different books even. It was, it was fascinating to me how little people wanted to explain what that meant. They were like, yeah, just you can absolutely be more creative. Just be more creative. I was like, you can be a pterodactyl. Just be a pterodactyl. So um, a number of years ago, I, I did about two years of improv comedy performing. And I would say that is a good way to practice creativity. But what it also taught me was that uh, creativity, it it requires a focus um, and, and sometimes limitations are good right. for that because what new people would do, one, one of two things, either they would have trouble thinking of anything to do, which right. is, of course, bad. Right. But then the the initial like, well, this I'm finally getting it. Uh, new new performers, they just go off the rails where it's just like makes no sense whatsoever. You know, right. it's like, oh, I'm an astronaut and I'm going to be sewing a dress on the moon. And, you know, it's just like, well, that was creative, I guess. But like why right Uh, it served no purpose and you're like well creativity doesn't need a purpose that's true but cognition does yeah and so where where people finally start getting good at it is when they realize okay i need to be constrained in some way i have a scene partner we're gonna be you know in a laundromat right and and that that's where the wackiness ends now now we need to focus on like what do i want you know and and the want has to be something logical um it can't be i want a rocket ship (laughs) um yeah, could be. But then, like, you really got to justify that. So creativity is uh, the more walls you can put up. Honestly, the better if you if you uh, they always say color outside the lines. But Which, for the record, it's really important to know this. You have to have lines to color outside of. Exactly. If you're given a blank sheet of paper, it is very difficult to come up with a great idea right, off, right off the bat. But if somebody gives you some parameters and says, well, you got to use a red crayon well, right off the bat. Now I'm having ideas of what to do with this red crayon just by right. by saying you only have a red crayon and you can't pick any other crayons. Right. That inspires creativity. Actually, one of my favorite authors um, is Tony Mendez, who you have met and I have not. And I will never forgive you for that because he's <laughs> dead now. Um, he if, for those who are unfamiliar with who Tony Mendez is he is the Ben Affleck character in Argo. Argo uh, is playing. He's playing Tony Mendez. He was a real life CIA operative who did amazing things. He wrote one of my absolute favorite books called Master of Disguise. Um, and in it, he talks about how some of the best uh, breakthroughs in CIA history were not in times of glut. They were not in times of them, of the CIA saying, whatever, whatever you want to do, we'll write a check. Like when, when the agency had all the money it could spend, they usually plateaued when the huge breakthroughs of the CIA in espionage and spycraft and things happened. It was when they were told, I don't know, here's a toothpick, figure that shit out. <laughs> yep. Like as movie making is the same way. <laughs> it, but movie making is the exact same way. If I can afford to do anything I want, I'm not going to do anything all that cool. Uh, but if I have to be, if I have to get creative, but not to just jump from one book plug to another, uh, Dr. Carmen Simon, she is a uh, cognitive neuroscientist in the San Francisco, uh, say the, the Silicon Valley kind of mm. Bay area, <clears throat> pardon me. And she is, she is a, she wrote a book that also that I love called impossible to ignore. Mm. And I actually reached out to her, uh, to re- when I was writing my book to ask her kind of to weigh in on the things I was saying about creativity and cognition, because all of her book impossible to ignore is about being noticed and being, yeah. you know, and standing out and having creativity ideas. And, and she, you know, we get on this phone call and she says, so like, tell me about your book. And I, 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 I launch into my, my whole making friends with the mouse thing. We did an entire episode on making friends with the mouse. I think it's like episode three or four, uh, go back. If you want to hear me describe it longer, but my whole concept of making friends with the mouse is that the phrase build a better mouse trap is stupid. It, it pre-prescribes the problem build to put together and assemble better, you know, better than what mouse. That's a very specific target trap. It's a very specific device. And then they say, build a better, it, it, it 
proposes innovation while precluding anything that even could be sort of innovative. And so my big joke to her, and I, I go in off on it in my book and I go off on it in our earlier podcast on this subject. What about a mouse fence? What about a supersonic frequency that just scares mice away? What about, you know, what about a, uh, a robotic mouse cat? Yeah. What about a Pied Piper that will lead all the mice away? And, and she laughed and she said something that will like, this is that really kind of messed with me. Uh, she said, are you as creative as the strength of your memories? And I kind of, I don't know what that means. What? And she's like, nothing you just said was creative. You didn't create anything. Those are all things you've heard of before. Those are all things you, you've heard of a fence before. You've heard of a dog whistle. You know how animals can hear frequencies we don't. You have heard of robots and a robot cat isn't necessarily a big leap. Nothing you just said. Did you just come up with anything new mm -hmm. what you just did is intentionally misalign memories you took things that didn't belong and applied them to a new problem which is creativity she's like i said you weren't being creative because people misunderstand creativity creativity is using things wrong on purpose taking things from diverse and disparate areas and, ex and concentrations and applying them where they don't belong to see if for some reason it works. Are you uh, familiar with the TikTok trend I've seen with the baby toy with the blocks? How is it possible that you've seen a TikTok trend that I have? I don't know. It's going around Reddit, but it's, um, you know, it's it's a video that people I've seen different responses to it. OK, um, it's it's one of those baby toys where it's like there's the circle, you know, the circle block goes in the circle and the triangle block goes in the triangle. Sure. It, it's that little play set. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But in this particular one, the square is kind of biggish. And so all of the blocks fit in the square one and so somebody has a video of it's himself it's an adult it's not a kid yeah. and he's like he's like circle block goes in square uh triangle block goes in square and all the reactions are people being like no that's wrong and like you know like just uh, bemoaning the fact that this guy's doing it wrong um and so he's kind of uh you know trolling everyone with how he does this kid's toy that's amazing but uh it's it's exactly that where it's uh there's the way you're expected to play with the toy. Right. And then he found out it worked a different way. No. And there is, I will say that seeing my children come up with uh, new ways to break things <laughs> that I would have never thought of. You know, we were interviewing a few weeks ago, we were interviewing a general uh, for one of our pieces and, and he was talking about rolling out new gear and rolling out new teams. He was like, they will break things in ways you never saw coming, but they will find ways to use it that you never <laughs> intended. He's like, you know, you got to break things quickly to figure out how they actually work. Yep. Um, but it's it's really it was a really amazing reframing of um, it was a really amazing reframing of creativity, like because in my brain, creativity was coming up with this new idea that never been thought of before. And for the most part, that's just not true, because. Since the wheel pretty much everything has been an incremental improvement from the thing before it. Yeah. Like the wheel we don't find in nature or anything. Nothing, no animals have wheels. Um, they have legs, they have wings, they can go underwater. There's no wheels that, and axles naturally occurring in nature. Everything else is just a, a, a combining of understandings from diverse areas, which is why we need to always be collecting those things. And it's also why, you know, people attribute Albert Einstein, some of his biggest, uh, biggest breakthroughs to being a patent clerk, two different reasons. One, he's being seeing new ideas all day long, not necessarily reading every word, but right. he's just being be inspired. <laughs> he's being deluged with new ideas all day long, but also it's a very menial, and very processy job. It doesn't require higher. So he both a was being triggered and, and, and poked by ideas all day, but also he was being under stimulated. I, that, I always hear that like doing things like Sudoku or, or and crossword puzzles are good for mental exercises because I think they are that they require creativity and yet they're also repetitive. Yeah. And they're, they're, they're really hard, but they're also mundane. Like you can it's look up interesting from, combo. <laughs> yeah. You can look up from a Sudoku bully, pu puzzle and unlike a PlayStation game, like, there's there's not even many. Yes, you can play Sudoku on your phone, but there's not even many phone games that are truly 
without time. Like the number of times I've, I've said to someone like, Hey, they're like, sorry, sorry, timed level. Can't, can't like, and that kind of active engagement is good, but like Sudoku crossword puzzles and other things that you can literally like do it actively and passively at the same time. It's, it's sparking imagination and creativity, but it's also remarkably low level and it yeah. lets your brain do other things in the background. And in terms of uh, reinventing things, I was reading up on Yahtzee yesterday for some reason on Wikipedia. Okay. The, uh, you know, the popular dice game. And as, as expected it, there are versions of it all over the world going back a thousand years. Yeah, you know, no, it's like it's, it's, a, it's like the Scandinavian game this and it's like the South American game this. And yeah. like it, it's you mean not people thought about rolling dice <laughs> to count up numbers to get different patterns. Yeah, yeah, not not unique. But of course, what is unique is somebody decided to give it a name and, you know, trademark the name and start selling it in the 50s. Right. Um, and I, I I was, you know, the Wikipedia rabbit hole. I started reading about this guy. And uh, what was his name? Something Lewis, I think. I, mean, I, I honestly thought you were going to say his name was like Jim Yahtzee. No, like, there's the, a couple of the games around the world have names that are like Yahtzee or that sound similar. So gotcha. he kind of ag- amalgamated some of them and, and made up this name. Uh, oh, this came about because my um, cousin who lives in Texas sent me a picture of, uh, you know, Hasbro owns owns Yahtzee. Sure. Um, he found a non copyrighted dice game with a picture of a boat on it. Yacht S E A C Yacht C the game Yacht C the classic dice game. <laughs> no copyright issues there. Um, yeah. But anyway, I started reading about official Yahtzee and, and this guy that that turned it from a classic game into a product. And uh, he's known for he was a toy maker and, and had all these other products. But his two most popular were Yahtzee and another game you may have heard of. Bingo. Now Someone you, invented bingo. You may think somebody invented bingo. Same thing. It, it existed. It was a game, you know, drawing. He's the guy that not only made it a product, but turned it into a fundraiser. He went to, you know, ladies clubs and fire stations and, and civics organizations. And it was like bingo night. He invented he, bingo night. Yeah. It's not that he invented bingo. He invented bingo night. And so he is the Ray Kroc. So like, yes. you know, Mc- <laughs> the Ray Kroc of board games, which is because the thing is like you know, everyone like attributes Ray Kroc to like inventing McDonald's. No, he didn't. McDonald's brothers invented McDonald's. Yeah, he just but, like blew it up. He just blew it up and invented the franchise. So that's what this guy did with with classic. So same thing you're saying. Did, did he invent anything? No. Both of those games existed. Both of them existed. But there are thousands of ancient games around the world. Yeah. He turned two of them into super popular. You know, he he packaged them basically hey, you gotta have a marketing person in your life i'm just saying <laughs> if you don't have one our numbers you know <laughs> uh and my favorite part at the end of the article was he had many other things in his life he opened a, a hotel in las vegas in 1960s two i think mm-hmm. um which was notable i think at the time and maybe ever it was the only hotel in the state of nevada that did not have a casino in it which just was okay so the guy like a lost opportunity on that one the guy known for bingo and yahtzee a dice game and a, a gambling money raising game he didn't put a casino in it so like i need to learn more about this I, guy i got it like this guy's working there? firing on a very different set of cylinders <laughs> not less cylinders not more cylinders just a very different set of cylinders there must have been some some brilliant idea behind that that wikipedia did not cover like i wonder if he has an autobiography or something because it's you know the, the man that invented <laughs> bingo and rolling dice not invented but you get my popularized that's amazing that's really funny no and it's you know we we talk from the very beginning through here you know to glean the cube to fail beautifully and that there is true beauty in failure there is true beauty in putting yourself out there whether or not it works because the beauty is in trying it if it worked or not is 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 a completely separate thing yeah um and sometimes the failure is fun and and doing it better until you stop failing is awesome and then you you know learn these things learn different things learn disparate things learn and apply new things to all of this stuff and that's what creativity is to go back to the very top where we're saying, you know, these these people say, you know, practice creativity. Like, uh, what does that mean? Do something wrong on purpose. I'm a project manager. I'm a project ma- uh, manager professional. I've done, you know, I've done this exact same show 1500 times. I've done the same building, the same. W- OK, then do it differently. Well, this is what works best. OK, cool. Then do it differently. Yeah. Take something low risk, something that you know how to do, you know how to fix it if something went wrong and do something crazy. Just like you said, just do it 
and it's too late to decide now. Just do something crazy and figure out how to fix it when you break it and see if you can't, you know, break it good because that's creativity. And it last book shout out of the day <laughs> in Adam Grant's book, The Originals, he talks about how and I won't get into how they measure this, but it was really fascinating. So read Adam Grant's books, The Originals or uh, uh, Originals, How How Nonconformists Rule the World, Change the World, something like that. Anyway. He talks about um, how when you test creatives, when you start looking at the creativity of people, it can easily, uh, one of the things, one of the easy early earmarks is, do they use Internet Explorer, Mm -hmm. slash, do they use Apple Mail, slash, do they use... um, a Microsoft like Outlook Express, uh, Microsoft Outlook. Is is the point, is the built-in thing, or did they find some new tool? No, no. If they use the tool that came standard, chances are they will have a low creativity index across other measured things. And it wasn't, they aren't related, but it's an indicator. Yeah. Because people are like, oh, I clicked internet and Internet Explorer opened up. Those people have never, truly, those people specifically in this case, have never tried anything else ever. Because there is no metric on which Internet Explorer was better at anything. But, you know, whether you used Firefox or Safari or Chrome or, you know, why would someone use Safari? And Safari has its merits. It's not Internet Explorer, but it's or, you know, the mail program or the Microsoft Outlook. It's So I'll give you the, the counterpoint to there. And I know you're talking statistical averages. I'm talking statistical averages. But uh, not not to brag about myself, but I'm going to compare myself to Steve Jobs here. Yeah, the, uh, I believe I use the built in mail and Safari for yeah. the same reason that Steve Jobs always wore the black turtleneck and the, the blue jeans, yep. which was it's one less thing to think about. So now I can focus on something else. And, <laughs> you know, it's really funny as I just read an article today about Mark Zuckerberg has, has taken only ever wearing a gray, uh, a gray T-shirt. Same reason. Yeah. Just, it's just like and the, there's something absolutely none of these things are. No, no. You use Safari. I read a thing. You're not yeah, creative. But it's a it's a. It, data point yeah <laughs> it's the are these people those that take what they are given or are these people that find what works for them are these people that operate within the system as it is prescribed to them or is it the people that find a way to make the system work with their system those are the creatives and those are really really low i but i have a real struggle with mail programs you know i download a new one every six months because i hate all of them yeah. <laughs> um but could I just double down and, and get used to it and start working with this? No, I'm going to keep trying to figure out one that works yeah. for me. Uh, there's absolute merit. I put a lot of time and effort in the failure of my mail programs that you just, you don't. You make the, the, the Steve Jobs one work. But all of that is kind of irrelevant to the general point of that's what practicing creativity means. Try using a different tool. Try using the wrong tool on purpose. Everything can be a hammer if you hit it hard enough. Yeah, no, I'm a, I'm a weird example to use for myself because I use Safari and Mail. Yeah, I have every alternative on my program on my computer for yeah. various jobs. I'm like, right. well, for this one I need this one, and for this one I need that one, and like, right. I'm using all these programs all the time. But uh, yeah. when it comes to just my time, like I don't want to think about it. <laughs> no, and again, gleaming the cube, practice failure. <clears throat> practice creativity and not in some practice creativity by being more creative. No practice creativity by finding something that you know is not going to work and do it beautifully gleam the cube, which I just, by the way, found on eBay for 1997. It'll be here Friday. We'll we'll talk about that next week. Okay. Thank you all so much. Uh, This has been release the creative and we will see you next week. Thanks for joining us here at Release the Creative. Kirk here would never say it to your face, but he thinks you should like and subscribe to us on YouTube. And Jeff is far too shy to admit it, but he thinks you should subscribe to us on your favorite podcast reader. Yeah? Well, you're the one who's always saying that everyone should give us five stars on Apple Podcasts. Why do you have to make everything so difficult? <laughs>